to everybody, and welcome to the International Peace Institute and this year's Trigvili Symposium, focusing on the role of social media in promoting democratization, human rights, prospects, and challenges. Uh, it's hard to believe, Jonas, but this is actually now our fourth annual symposium, so I think it's now grown into uh, an institution, which I'm very happy about. And it is uh, a special privilege for us to co-host this initiative with the government of Norway. And I'd like to extend warm welcome to Foreign Minister Jonas Garstøre, a good friend, and to his colleagues from Norway who have been working with us to prepare for this event. Before I give you the floor, Jonas, let me say a few words by way of introduction. We've heard a lot about the role of social media in recent time. Indeed, in the wake of the Arab Spring and other events in Europe, we are trying to understand how the power of social media is transforming and shaping our everyday life. Used responsibly and constructively, these tools have been shown to be effective at promoting human rights, justice, and democratization. However, we've also seen that when they are used irresponsibly and recklessly, social media can spread, can spread negative values and undermine and suppress a democratic process. So how can we work to ensure that social media is used as a progressive, and not a counterproductive tool to boost freedom and democracy? How can we support civil society and social media actors working to promote human rights and sometimes very difficult and risky circumstances? And how do we respond when social media is used in, in the opposite way to spread hate speech and to undermine the democratic process? These are some questions that we'd like to discuss today. I think we have a terrific panel to help us to drill deeper into these challenges. Let me also remind everyone that our discussion is on the record. We are also webcasting this event live today. And in terms of our own social media um, outreach today, we will be sharing our, our discussion through Twitter and Facebook. And we've also created a special Twitter hashtag, you can see it here, which is uh, hashtag Trigvili in one word. We encourage everyone to share your comments and ideas about this event on Twitter. Actually, I know for a fact that um, the Foreign Minister of Sweden, Carl Bildt, who's with us today, has taken uh, a, a step uh, further than using Twitter because he has both a blog and a Twitter account. Isn't that correct, Carl? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, I do hope that um, you will have a very interesting uh, discussion. And with these words, let me now give the floor to Jonas to present our panelists and to chair our event. Jonas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tadja, uh, and, and welcome to all. Uh, we're happy to see that there are uh, it's a full audience. And for those of you who didn't get the seat, I hope we can excite you so you will uh, enjoy standing following the discussion, which I hope will be informal and close and, and, and on the, uh, the subject. I would like to, to um, uh, introduce um, our participant, um, Nasser Jude, the Foreign Minister of Jordan, will be with us uh, uh, shortly. Carl Wilt, neighbor, friend, and uh, fellow Foreign Minister from Sweden, uh, is with us here. Uh, he's a Twitter and blogger, and I would say, uh, a compassionate uh, follower of uh, communication technology and the links to politics since many, many years. Then uh, Maria Otero, once again, happy to see you here. Thank you. Under Secretary of State for Democracy and Global Affairs of the United States, uh, and um, having worked on internet freedom uh, as a, a, an important theme, and we heard the President today speak about open society, so here the links are clear. Nora Yunis, very happy to see you here, human rights activist, journalist, and blogger. So all that can go on your little card uh, from Egypt. And of course, uh, uh, your experiences will be of great interest to this discussion. Uh, you won the Human Rights uh, First 30th Anniversary Award in 2008 for using new media tools. So you have really been seeing how this uh, can work in practice. And then <clears throat> we have um, 
uh, Claire Diaz Ortiz, a manager, social innovation and executive leadership from Twitter. So here we have the, uh, the source uh, of the technology, uh, so to say. Uh, Mr. Wissam Tarif, uh, uh, Arab world campaigner for Avas, that's a global movement, former director of uh, Insan. Uh, and you also, uh, Mr. Tarif, uh, are a campaigner uh, for the Arab world, uh, where we now see democracy coming bottom-up, partly driven by uh, uh, technology. Um, if I may say as a piece of introduction, and then I'll, I'll pass the floor on to the other panelists, and I hope we will get going, and also to engage the audience. Uh, my, my point here would be to say that uh, there's a lot of focus on technology, and for good reason. Two years or, or three or four years ago, when the monks of Burma went on the streets, we could follow it here during the General Assembly uh, with pictures coming out, and it made immediately the situation in Myanmar a theme at the General Assembly. Uh, now we have uh, the events in Tunisia and Egypt and throughout the Arab world, which is proving how uh, this is an important challenge for authoritarian regimes and opportunity for people who are uprising. But I think the point here, which I would like to make, is that neither Facebook nor Twitter brought down Mubarak or Ben Ali. It was people who did it. So people who took to the streets unarmed, apart from a conviction that they had their moment of opportunity. So here I believe we, at least as I approach it, is that social media, with all its uh, opportunities, are tools and multipliers. For human rights defenders of today, these tools offer a much more effective way of bringing out information, organizing, reaching out across borders. Uh, and this efficiency, of course, triggers repressive regimes. And they have not been slow to respond. Today, around 60 countries are listed as exercising some form of internet censorship. They filter, they infiltrate, they manipulate, and they harass. So there is another technology branch growing up from uh, uh, with, with those opportunities. And, and especially for human rights defenders, this insecurity of digitally stored or communicated information via social media can prove to be a great vulnerability, dilemma. So here is a double-edged or multi-edged sword. It can be a tool and it can be used uh, both for good and bad. Uh, I think we are, as we try to digest what happened in Norway on the 22nd of July, when Norway was struck by terror, we, we find that behind the act there's a whole array of communication on that net uh, uh, which, uh, uh, in which no person perceives to be a lonely wolf, because there are these um, uh, artificial communities which are being created and, and, and can create frameworks for also for, for gruesome acts. But regardless of the complexity of internet freedom, uh, we convene this meeting because we believe it merits to be analyzed from different angles. The main principle prevails, uh, and that is that uh, the same rights that people have offline, freedom of expression, freedom to seek information, freedom of assembly and association amongst others must also be protected online. And these are the words of the Monsieur Franck Larue, in his report to the Human Rights Council, he is a UN Special Rapporteur on the freedom of opinion and expression. Finally, I believe, and as we discussed before we convened here, that um, perhaps the biggest communication revolution was when Gutenberg did his uh, printing uh, breakthrough. Uh, that was led to profound civilizational and political changes, although in slow motion. Today we have kind of Gutenberg innovations happening uh, much more rapidly uh, and spread much more rapidly. And we are probably just in the midst of it or in the very early stage. And that's why we think it can be of inspiration to hear uh, uh, views of uh, uh, governments and uh, practitioners and bloggers and Twitters and those who have been in the middle of it. So uh, with those words, welcome to the panelists. And um, I think we will uh, uh, proceed. Uh, Carl, may I invite you to ask questions, share perspectives, and we will go around the table and, and, and hear what, uh, what people think. No, oh, yeah, just a couple of remarks. Um, I share everything what you said, Jonas, um, that uh, we have now gotten into a situation where social media is getting a lot of attention. That is a good thing. 
And uh, that has been caused very much by what happened in Tunisia, what happened in Egypt, where social media was undoubtedly important. Although you could argue that even if you restrict yourself to technologies, there might have been other technologies that were even more important. I mean, direct satellite broadcast of television is something that is also turning political systems around the world upside down. Then social media comes on top of that. But at the end of the day, of course, it was, it was the people. But that was the same with the Gutenberg revolution. It wasn't the books, it was the people that were reading the books that made the transformation of Europe and paved the way for, for everything would happen. This is virgin territory for politics. And I would argue that so far that has been a rather good thing. I was involved for a couple of years in something called ICANN, which most of you hopefully haven't heard of, which is sort of uh, called the Internet Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers. And that is the um, sort of private corporation registered in California, which really runs all of the systems that makes the internet work. The internet started uh, really by sort of uh, uh, nerds around the world that were running it independently of any state interference for quite some time. And ICANN is still, although it has a contractual relationship, which is looser and looser and looser with the US government, with the Department of Commerce, is essentially a private self-regulating authority. So far, so good. It's been outside of politics. That is now changing uh, for two reasons. First, because there is a threat to the freedom of the net, uh, as Jonas indicated. When this becomes a more, power, more and more powerful tools of communication, there are governments that are not particularly interested in the freedom of speech. When it comes to the ordinary media, they're trying to restrict this particular media. And we've seen a proliferation of activities, technologies around the world when it comes to filtering and great firewalls and all of those things that you are aware of. Uh, that made it necessary for us to take up this issue on the political agenda. And we've, from the Swedish side, put internet freedom high on our foreign policy agenda. We've been working with Frank LaRue with the report that he has been, uh, he's been introducing or producing. And we now have, uh, together with 40 other nations, and we now have a plan to bring that work further within the uh, primarily the Human, Human, Human Rights Council, but also in other international fora, together with like-minded governments, notably the US government, but also broaden that coalition in the world. But the second factor that has changed the equation is, of course, the threat not to the freedom of the net, to the security of the net. Cyber security, cyber war, you name it, it's all over the media. And it is a reality that the security, the safety of the net is under constant threat, and that the net is used also by those that have evil or not particularly good intentions of different sorts. And what I do see as a risk that policymakers should be aware of is that we have us, the good guys, speaking about the freedom of the net. And then we have other guys, uh, also good, I hope, talking about the security of the net and doing their things. But that there develops two different cultures that are looking at the net and doing different things from different perspectives. We need, at the same time as we emphasize the uh, importance of the freedom of the net agenda, we need to bring it together with the security of the net agenda. Because if they start to diverge and go in different directions, I think we'll go into difficulties. And we do have, of course, the difficulties inside our different governments, that we have different types of people and different agencies doing freedom things, and different agencies doing security things. Bringing them together is not entirely easy. But that, I think, is a big task for, for, for policymakers. Uh, we are sometimes asked, people like Jonas and myself, to indicate which are going to be the big policy issues five or ten years down the road. And of course, essentially, we don't know, because the word is a fast-changing thing. But I think it is virtually certain that these issues, the freedom of the net, the governance of the net, and the security of the net, are going to be much higher up on the international policy agenda five not to speak about 10 years from now than they are today. And that it's important that we early on, as we go from this self-regulatory freedom stage, which I think has been very good and extremely beneficial for global development, as we go into the next stage of development, that we make certain that it is the values and the interests of the democratic societies and the 
open nature of our governance structures that is those values that also comes to dominate the entire discussion and that we can also develop the legal and political and to a certain extent also the technological instruments to counter those that want to restrict the freedom of the net. Happy to say, I think, that uh, in this battle between those that want to control the net and those that want to keep it free, you sometimes get the impression that those that want to control have the upper hand. I do tend to believe that it is going to be the other way around. It is very difficult to control completely. That's a good thing, but that is not an argument for us not being extremely vigilant, extremely offensive and forward-looking when it comes these, to these particular issues. Um, the net, you can say, is the new front line for defense of freedom across the world, and we must treat it, treat it as such. Thanks. Thank you, Carl. Uh, you may applaud. No. Um, I think... I'll turn to, to, to Nora Yunis, and of course um, Egypt is an attraction for us to understand what happened and what may happen. And, and what is important by, <coughs> by, by, by Nora's work is that um, uh, she clearly was uh, part of the movement that brought about change, but now she is challenging the uh, council which is uh, ruling Egypt and atten attempting to uh, put restrictions on, 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 on the freedom of uh, uh, expression and, and, and on media, uh, putting on media <coughs> response. So, Nora, will you share with us, please? Thank you so much. And um, I couldn't agree with you more that the social networks had this major role in what happened in Egypt, but I don't want to overplay it. The revolution did not happen by coincidence or due to some hashtag or some Facebook group or something. Um, it's been a lot of work done on the ground uh, by even generations like before my generation, there has been a lot of constructive uh, dissent <laughs> happening over years and years and decades that led to this uh, moment. I think that social networks expedited an explosion that was predestined um, to happen. And um, if I can a little bit look at the uh, tools that we were using, and I'm, I'm very proud to, be, to belong in a, to a generation that believed in change and saw it really happening. Um, I think because when we started using the social networks, it was just uh, as it was portrayed by the Western media at this time, the English-speaking Cairo-based uh, bloggers and activists. Uh, but the movement changed and uh, social networks became used by average Egyptians who do not speak English and outside, of course, the capital. But the Western media com continues, uh, and I think this is one of its failures, to look at the uh, descent from the Cairo English-speaking uh, gang point, point of view only. Uh, so one of the main factors of success was uh, the, the localization and the decentralization that uh, happened in Egypt and I believe in the rest of the Arab world. And uh, thanks to this today, we in Egypt can communicate via Twitter with uh, police officers who are in service, but tweeting in Arabic without hashtags. They don't know how to use hashtags. They are unhappy with the situation of the police department from inside and we are communicating with them to see how to reform um, the police. And uh, for years and years, I think the million dollar question was how to make a dictatorship regime less dictatorship or give up its uh, dictatorship. And the way I saw it happening really was, uh, of course, the um, social media played a role, as I said, of expediting um, things. Um, and especially when they come in a moment of civil carriage, I mean, you see Iran. Iran has the biggest online community and the largest groups using social media. But I think in Egypt it was more uh, a moment of hopelessness where things were really going uh, to change something. And um, I think also that um, <coughs> this, this moments of civil courage that we saw are still facing a lot of challenges especially with the Supreme uh, Council for Military uh, Affairs, that we call it the SCAF. And uh, currently the SCAF, uh, and you will see on Twitter the hashtag NoSCAF, 
and the hashtag no mill trials <laughs> are like uh, our own popular uh, um, hashtags on Twitter because now the online community is trying to organize and arrange against the um, uh, emergency status that the SCAF is trying to, uh, to is actually bringing back uh, to Egypt and the military trials which uh, 12,000 civilians have to stand. Um, so the battle continues actually to drag. And of course, there are pressures on the mainstream media, again, by the SCAF. And after announcing there will not be a Minister of Information, now we have a Minister of Information. Um, because I run an online uh, news portal, I think the online has still a <coughs> bit margin of freedom over the print in Egypt. But it's not what we are hoping for. There is a, still a lot and a lot um, to do. And as I saw, like one of the uh, the questions we should be discussing today uh, by uh, Ambassador T Terry Rod Larson, uh, some of the questions deal with the security or the abuse of the social networks. I think it's our role um, to protect the social networks by keeping them as is and ask the governments to stay actually out of it. Because in all our countries, we have seen uh, state security apparatus that turn to be dictatorship security apparatus. So internet security turns out to be, does not help the privacy of the online activists, but actually helps monitoring and uh, tapping and following uh, the activists and um, putting them in, and endangering their lives and their work. Um, so my personal recommendation to this would just be like, leave the internet alone. It's doing very well and we are very happy with it the way it is. <laughs> Thank you. I'll turn to uh, Maria Otero. I, I think, you know, one issue we can, when I turn the floor to you, is really how can the international community help uh, in a situation where clearly this is vulnerable. I mean, you can't perform now, but you feel something is coming. There's a Ministry of Information. There is, uh, uh, yeah, s s stricter scrutiny. And, and, and how can we, you know, keep the, the, the light on that? Maria, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be on this panel uh, and to be invited back. Thank you. Um, building on what we've heard already um, and thinking that certainly the Internet will be and continue to be uh, one of uh, the central areas that we're going to be um, having to, as, as fundamental to the way in which uh, we operate. I think it's... Ah, as we say in Spanish, pequeño detalle. I didn't turn the microphone on. Um, and this is a technology. And this, I know, you know. Um, the, the point I was making is that as we are seeing the internet freedom issue be so central as we look ahead, it is important to be um, absolutely reminded, and certainly in our case, why it's become a foreign policy priority for us. Why uh, Secretary Clinton has really um, coined this phrase, uh, freedom to connect, because really the internet freedom is grounded in the, in, um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's grounded in the International Convention of Civil and Political um, Rights. And these are precisely the, the kinds of uh, ways in which we can all agree that uh, the, the question of whether it should be open, free, and accessible to all is really one that is hand in hand with um, democratic um, systems and systems that are open to uh, free expression, which is, I think, what we all seek. So really relating the internet freedom to a declaration created in 1948 when nobody even believed that there was anything of this sort makes all the sense in the world, because it is really grounded in that. So that's, I think, one very important point of departure. The second one is, again, to pick up from the, the two um, comments made before. And really, there is no question that it, it is the people that make um, the events happen, not the technology. And we've uh, heard this from everybody that's speaking here. But it's something that we need to also keep track of, because it isn't really just a question of putting the, the technology, putting the social media um, before a group to really make the kind of changes happen that, for example, have happened in Egypt. I think your observations are enormously important because it really shows the, um, the rigor, the discipline, the vision of people who understand the work from trying 
to achieve their own individual rights and their own sense of being able to participate in their society. And the, uh, the technology becomes one tool that they can use that accelerates the process and that may allow them to do things that they couldn't do before. But the centrality of the individual uh, and the liberty for that individual continues to remain, again, central to any movement and to any process that we move forward. So I think this is important. It reminds me, I was in Tunisia and in Egypt last week. Um, and in Tunisia, as I, was, I spoke with a lot of civil society um, groups and bloggers and, and others, and in Tunisia, one young man said to me, the obvious, but it really stuck with me. And he said, the advantage of the Tunisian revolution is that it was started by the Tunisian people. Um, and the statement is obvious to us here, but you know, when you think about the fact that um, that is really what we are looking to do, is to really empower people to be able to do their own work, this is um, one of the pieces that I think is very important. It leads us to, I think, one, a couple of other issues. One is, and I'll just put a couple of additional issues here, and that is that as the social media has become a tool, the degree of harassment, um, the degree of threats, um, and the degree of vulnerability, as we've talked about, of um, people that are using this, uh, uh, that are using social media and that we're seeing throughout the world has increased and part of our own role as we protect the human rights of people is to help protect those, um, um, those courageous people and to see them as the human right defenders of today and of the future. Um, so I think part of our role is to work closely with the private sector because the private sector can also help us create technologies that will help this human right defenders uh, circumvent some of the problems that they're facing uh, or be able to address some of the problems that exist when we're seeing uh, all kinds of ways of um, denying them the opportunity to be able to both protect themselves and protect the work that they're doing. So technology and, technolo and, and you know, technology companies can help create firewalls so that governments uh, can limit the freedom of internet or they can create uh, tools that can help us enhance the freedom of uh, the internet. So I think the importance of being able to work across and, and to form partnerships is enormously important. And, and then let me, let me just um, end in, in talking also, also about when I give the example about Tunisia, I would also say that in Egypt, and it's very good to, to, to hear this, Egypt, everyone that I spoke with showed a great deal of concern that really the movement, uh, the revolution of Tahir was being derailed um, and that it really was not going to be able to move, uh, move forward. But you also see here a difficulty or a challenge um, in how it is that those that were involved in online activism and that achieved what they've achieved through Tahir Square and through bringing people uh, to express their position, how it is that they are transitioning from that to being engaged in electoral activity um, because that becomes the next step in a transition. Um, and that, we think, is, uh, is one of the issues that I certainly heard a great deal of concern about in, uh, in Egypt. And then finally, I would say uh, some of you might have noted yesterday that um, uh, the president of Brazil and president of the United States launched the Open Government Partnership, which um, um, Norway is very involved in. But this Open Government Partnership is an effort to move governments themselves to become more transparent and more accountable and to be more responsive to their own uh, citizens, but to do it through the use of technology um, and, to, and to use internet freedom and to use technology itself as one way in which you, one can make governments more accountable. So it's not just a revolutionary movements, which you know in the Arab Spring have attracted our attention, but it's also how we use these tools in order to advance <coughs> governments towards becoming uh, improved in the governance that they carry out. So let me just stop there.
Thank you, Maria. Um, I'll turn to uh, Mr. Wissam Tarif, uh, and I think, you know, as a human rights um, campaigner and working for democracy, we are particularly keen to hear you because you have followed countries that we now follow with great interest, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Yemen, uh, uh, kind of behind closed walls, but uh, a lot is happening. What do you see? Thank you. Well, uh, I will start talking basically about Syria and uh, what is going on and how we're using or how people are using uh, social media tools and the change that's taking place. When I first started to do Syria, it was in 2020, I remember we're trying to work on a development project in rural areas where people would have access to computers, internet, and learn English or another foreign language. We, no one was thinking about revolutions. Back then, I think very few people in Syria in particular, like human rights defenders and activists, most of them were in jail, so no one really was thinking that the change will happen, uh, will happen, especially uh, international community. They were convinced this guy will never leave. Unfortunately, some still do think the same until now. Um, Social media tools. When the uprising I uh, started in Syria, I totally agree with Noura that it happens with people. In Syria, it's happening very much with the flesh and the blood of the Syrian people. The death toll is tremendously high. Uh, we see an army that is killing its own people. How did the people organize this? And what stands behind it? Definitely the regime has been telling us that a Western conspiracy has been again uh, behind the uprising in Syria. Uh, I've been there three times since the uprising in different areas in Syria. And the only thing that stands behind this uprising is the Syrian people will, because they want to be free and they want to live in democracy. They used Facebook to organize themselves and to spread the word. They used Twitter. And when the violations, when the army started to attack the population, we've seen it from Dara up till to Hama, up till to Deir Zor, very much up in the north, using social media tools to document the violations. Part of what we do is death tolls and trying to recognize the victims, to give them a name and put them in a list. Most of that work has been done via social media tools. But of course the regime switched off the button in many places in different occasions and tried to do what Mubarak did. No internet, no set, uh, no mobile phones in specific areas. Part of the social media, part of the internet, as civil society, we're not isolated. We were able to bring sat phones. We were able to bring sat modems, put it on a router and give people internet access and activists internet access when the regime decided to switch it off. When they cut off the sat, uh, the, the cell phones, well, sat phones did it. So we continue to document, people continue to report what is going on. And as you know, in Syria, there is no foreign media. Actually, there is no media. The few who were allowed to get into the country, they were in Damascus. No one else, like Hama or, well, except the American ambassador, I think he went to Hama. Uh, and the French one, that is right. So what do we do with all the information and why it's important to get the information out using social media tools? Because we need to lobby you, lobby other states, tell them what's going on, bring numbers, that a lot of politicians, a lot of people in, at the international community very much question sometimes the numbers because they were collected via social media tools. <coughs> so yes, it is a vague area and there are a lot of questions and perhaps very few answers comes from decision makers when it comes to how we're using these, uh, these, uh, these tools. I, I heard Noura talking especially about the process now in Egypt and her concerns and a lot of activist concerns about legislations and about where the country is going to. Part of what I do, I do Iran and Yemen. What I know, what I've experienced so far, there's one thing in common in all these countries. 
when you do not let people talk freely and express what they want, they become creative. And that sphere, internet, is full of potentials and of possibilities. And that's what Yemenis now are doing. Very much people from the Green Movement in Iran are doing. A last example. In Avaz, part of what our campaigns was also Palestine. And we managed to collect a million signature via internet, asking countries to recognize Palestine as an independent state. So yes, internet is full of potentials, of bad things and of good things. And I think like many people in the Middle East so far, especially activists and people who are very revolutionary style and want change, have been using it to do good things. Thank you. Uh, last speaker on the panel believes that we can change the world one tweet at a time. Is that right? That is right. That is right. And that's the title of a book that she published back in August. Uh, and we're very happy to have you here. Claire Diaz Ortiz, you have the floor. Yeah. Ah, there we go. So I'm very glad that I'm giving my intro at the end of all these great speakers because I want to be clear about what I do and what I don't do. Um, I, I lead social innovation at Twitter, the company. So that means that I work with individuals and with organizations who want to use this platform. You can call it a social media platform. I call it a real-time information platform. People who want to use this platform to change the world. But I don't change the world. I, I just listen to other people who do it. And everyone on this panel ha has talked about how you know, Twitter or other forms of social media, new media, are are tools for activists who are really making the change. And I, I must echo that wholeheartedly. At Twitter every day, I listen to individuals and organizations who are using Twitter in crazy, new, innovative ways. And when I was writing my book, Twitter for Good, I was, I was overwhelmed by the incredible work that people out there are doing. But we need to remember, and I know everyone on this panel agrees with what I'm about to say, People are always going to do amazing work. People are always going to be activators. And right now, new media and social media are excellent ways to multiply those messages. But these people and these activators and these change makers have always existed, and they will always exist. They will just use different tools. A year ago, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece called Why the Revolution Won't Be Tweeted. I think that was the exact title, right? And Oh man, there was so much controversy around it if you work in social media like I do. And I remember for a few months after that piece, every conference I went to referenced his article. And at the time, it was this big question, is he right? You know, Can the revolution not be tweeted, really? And now a year later, there's no question. We all know people are tweeting revolutions. 2009, 2011, the year we're in, has clarified that. But what Nora is saying is right. Hashtags don't make revolutions. And that's clearer than ever. I, I remember last year, I was at Personal Democracy Forum, and one of your colleagues, Alec Ross, was there. And he said something about this that really struck me. It was, again, in reference to a question about the Malcolm Gladwell piece. And someone asked him, you know, so Mr. Ross, what do you, what do you think? Can can revolutions really be activated through social media platforms? Can we really make change through that? And he said, you know, social media is one more tool. And let's look at the 1960s civil rights movement in America and look at how television shaped and multiplied that movement. And then let's make a comparison to how social media is, is affecting the change makers and movements of today. So uh, that's all. I, I'm here to listen. Thanks. Well, we won't let you listen um, immediately. You have to answer, answer a question. Carl Bildt was kind of saying the thing that politicians do say, that you know, we cannot say 10 years down the road what will be the main theme. We can guess on some trends, and I agree with Carl that this is going to be one of those trends. But from your platform, in a double sense, you, you are on a social uh, media platform, but you also have an overview of this technological development. Can, can you speculate what do you see five, ten years down the road in terms of trends coming out of uh, what this technology... I mean, we hadn't heard of Twitter and Facebook five years ago. Sure. I think one of the things we're all going to be seeing is we're going to be seeing more localization of new media and how that really changes things. And I think 
sort of some of the under, on the ground activists that we have on this panel will probably echo that statement. But certainly in the last year and a half, that's one of the big shifts we've seen in new media. Certainly people are getting more engaged with images and video and that, but localization is where it's really, really changing. What, what, what do you mean by localization, physically or? Well, Nora, do you want to answer that, I feel? Um, I have one thing we need. <laughs> I can put on top of the list, we need Arabic hashtags. It's going to make a huge, tremendous difference repeat, because we repeat. have uh, we need Arabic hashtags for Twitter because all the activists, you know, they stay day and night going crazy, just trying to trend globally. And it just <laughs> it, it's not usually very successful. But if we have Arabic hashtags, it's going to be, um, I think, our own thing then. No, by localization, you know, what I mean is we're still in a situation where Twitter's five years old, but Twitter was still, you know, was always started by a company in San Francisco. It started out in the West and it has increased its influence certainly over the years, but the tools of new media need to be localized by the participants in the different individuals, countries, et cetera. But, but why do you need that? I mean, I use Twitter in Norway. I, I, I don't care it was developed on the West Coast. It's very much present in my daily life in Norway, in the, in the life of my kids and, 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 and all the media. Well, one thing is you're very lucky you speak English. Excuse me? <laughs> we have Norwegian hashtags. Maria. I would say a couple of things um, related to that, which is that uh, I, I have absolutely no idea what technologies will be um, created. I am old enough to have to be running pretty fast just to keep up with things and to try to understand one from the other. Um, I mean, I. When I wrote a master's thesis, I did it on a Smith Corona typewriter, where you had a little piece of paper to block out the errors that you made. So uh, there's people here in this room that remember that. So clearly, how the technology moves forward is really going to happen with, inven with inventions, some of which are going to be um, uh, just coincidental. What I think is going to be very important as we the kind of trends that we should drive to move forward is how we expand the use of this technology and of this social media so that it is used um, not only uh, to protest or to demand, which is what it is doing now so incredibly, but also to help shape uh, the ways in which governments are able to um, to carry out their own work in response to, um, to the needs that their citizens make clear. Um, I think that's one way. And the second one is to begin to answer um, to the great challenges of hunger and malnutrition um, and to poverty that we see in um, many parts of the world, where the use of, um, of social media could really help us advance in being able to provide services, being able to provide information, being able to help um, mothers who don't know how to take care of the newborns be able to do it. So there's many different ways that I think the challenge is on us to be able to take um, this technology and move it towards the same goals that we have today, uh, but to advance it better and, uh, and in a, a more uh, responsive way. I'll pass the floor to the Swedish Foreign Minister. I'd just like to ask you, to, to uh, the three of you, to ponder uh, what, what are your uh, expectations of uh, governments? Uh, I mean, assuming we are democratic, uh, transparent governments, what, do you expect governments to do things or don't do things in relation to this technology, if you can think about that? I'll <coughs> pass the floor to Carl. You will have the opportunity to ask the question, and then I'll open uh, uh, the floor. Carl. Well, you know, you ask how things are going to be in 10 years' time, and the basic answer is, of course, I haven't got a clue. But just in order to be provocative and illustrate the point, Twitter will be dead. And I'm not saying that because I know that Twitter will be dead. I only know that in 10 years' time, technology will give us completely different possibilities. So that will, in all likelihood, be something that we can't even dream of now. Because technology is developing so fast that it's difficult to think too much ahead. It is dependent upon uh, a couple of factors. One is them is, is of course, the, the networks. That the networks are deployed all over the world, that they are reasonably secure and reasonably safe, 
and it's, it's booming. I only know the statistic from Stockholm, but in Stockholm the bandwidth requirement is doubling every six months. I mean, the exponential growth of bandwidth requirement for the networks. Huge investments are going into this. It's happening all over the world. In other parts of the world, somewhat less advanced. But look at Africa, what is happening there. I mean, most Africans have never had a telephone, and they will never have a telephone. The telephone for them is a museum piece in the Western world. I mean, the telephones, the landline things. They go directly to these new technologies. It is mobile. It is uh, smartphones. It is bandwidth. They do banking in remote villages of Kenya which gives market possibilities to farmers and give them access to political information that was never there with technologies that were only dreamt of five years ago. None of us could do it. That's why I'm saying where we are five or ten years from now. We don't know. But it's going to be as different from what we discuss today as what we are discussing today is from what was there ten years ago. Um, so it's somewhat provocative to say that Twitter won't be there, but that's just to sort of focus your minds on the sort of revolutionary pace of change all over the world. But what will remain, if we manage to deploy the networks uh, all over and the bandwidth, it could be space-based, could be cables, could be whatever, we are dependent upon them, are these two sort of values that are important, safeguard the freedom, the values that we have in our open societies should be safeguarded, whatever te the technology is, and then, of course, the stability, the security of the system, so that no one can interfere duly with them. That's going to be increasingly important, whatever the technology brings us. And then third factor, or fourth factor, whatever it is, much is going to be dependent on the ingenuity, the innovative ability of individuals to find new things. And for all of the all of the develop, all of the discussion we have in the U.S. and Europe about us being overtaken by China and whatever, we might be, but never forget that free societies are societies of free spirits. And at the end of the day, it is free spirits that create all of the opportunities that these technologies make possible. So from that point of view, I'm rather optimistic about the prospect of our Western and free societies. We don't know if the Twitter will be the Telefax of 2021. <laughs> Forgotten, but uh, they will be something new. Would you like to uh, make any intervention before we pass to the floor? Sure. Here? Yeah, please. Um, I want to follow a little bit of, of what was just said in terms of access in Africa in particular. Um, I, I began tweeting while living in an orphanage in Kenya and I began tweeting simply because I knew people on Silicon Valley. And I was certainly one of probably the first few hundred people on Twitter from Kenya, certainly at least within my region of Kenya at the time. Am I not on? Okay. Oh, OK. And because of my, my connection to East Africa, I've been very interested in Twitter's use in East Africa and throughout all of Africa in the last few years. And I think that one of the saddest things to be seen um, yes, Twitter, sorry, yes, mobile technologies um, can afford for mobile payments on M-Pesa and all sorts of other tools in Africa, but overwhelmingly, the penetration of tools like Twitter is incredibly low. Mm -hmm. And something that will change within five years and 10 years, and whether it's Twitter or whether it's something else, that increased access is really going to change what we know about how internet changes people's lives in the world. So I think we just need to be clear that Mm. It's, you know, a tiny, tiny percentage of where it should be in a lot of those areas. Yeah, I think uh, governments actually should do something about Internet uh, and about legislations. And basically it's for government to use it to become more transparent to tell us citizens what they are doing and what they are not doing is the first time that we don't have to be democratic only when we go to vote. We can enhance that process. We can exchange and communicate with our representatives and our governments on a daily basis. And I think that is where democratic and transparent countries should invest in in the future. Maybe just a little um, 
a reflection on the um, personal reflection on the future. Actually, this is the first trip outside Egypt. I go without a laptop. I decided this time only to depend on my mobile phone, <laughs> and uh, it's it's much more convenient and lighter. <laughs> So maybe um, maybe more um, handheld uh, democracy or direct access to democracy in the future is where we are heading. And here we have to remind ourselves a bit because, as you see, in Egypt we've got rid of Mubarak, but all his system is mm. still there and we still have to fight with them. So maybe we have to look back at some of their old ways because I feel they are going to rebuild themselves and face uh, us again with it. Um, how did they use to stop uh, these uh, human rights defenders? There was this online censorship and there was this offline retaliation of certain people and um, you know, earmarking uh, some uh, prominent uh, human rights um, defenders by like kidnapping, uh, beatings, uh, torture without anything on record at the end of the day. Um, we even came to learn when the files were opened how our previous Minister of Interior was possibly engaged in the church uh, blow up uh, in Egypt. So they would actually make up some terrorist acts in order to entrench uh, their violations against uh, human rights. And even now there is an interpretation that they, there was some sort of facilitation to the invasion of the Israeli embassy, which was followed immediately by the bringing back of the emergency laws. So we have to stay alert, not just for online censorship, but also for the, I'm sorry to say, offline dirty games <laughs> by the regime and um, God be with us. Please, uh, I open the floor with you. Uh, there will be microphones, and if you can uh, introduce yourself, that will help. And perhaps turn so that the camera can get your face and not only your neck. Madam, in the first row, please. Uh, my name is Carol Bogert. I'm the Deputy Director of Human Rights Watch. Um, on the question of what is the future of the technology and where we are in 10 years, I think it does seem clear, as you suggested, that uh, different capacities merge, that the computer and the television become uh, closer together, that the telephone and the computer and the television become closer together, and that the capacities of each device is, is multiplied uh, in terms of the images that it carries, for example, Twitter being a rather quaint text-based service. I think we can expect that to change. Uh, along those lines, as you ask what governments can do to help, um, we are talking now with people who use the technology um, in defense of human rights, but you have to look also at the people who are human rights defenders who struggle to use the technology. And traditionally, uh, communications at NGOs is treated as a kind of a PR function <coughs> rather than as a central element of the methodology of making change. This has to change. And those of you who are in a position to help NGOs to develop this aspect of their work need to do so. Finally, I think there's a slightly strange lacuna on the panel. Um, uh, well, we have a representative from a private company here, but it must be said that the internet is not just created by people and by activists, and it's not only the people and the politicians who deal with it, it's private companies who shape the way the tools are used. What happens when Facebook makes a joint venture with Baidu in China? What happens when I post a, Tib a Tibet video on my Facebook page and my friend in China clicks on it and watches it and gets arrested? What are the standards for private companies in the new era? There is something called the Global Network Initiative, the GNI, Human Rights Watch participant, many of us are. It's an attempt to set standards for private industry. Private industry is responsible and responsive when they are publicly embarrassed and forced to become so, and when they are hauled in front of the United States Congress to make testimony about what they're doing. So these are things that government can do to help push this issue forward. Last year here at this Trigvili Symposium, that was the theme, corporate social responsibility at large. And I think, you know, this year, Maria, we could have added this on in a much more forceful way. Interesting, good point. Well, I, I, did, I did bring it up. I mean, the role of the private sector is essential, and, and we agree completely on that. Uh, two things. One thing is, uh, yes, I'm Robert Keston, executive director of PDHRE, which is the People's Movement for Human Rights, Learning, and Integration. Um, on your point of bringing things for women into Africa, it's happening on cell phones. People are sending videos and mm -hmm. breastfeeding and all of that's being done. On your point, when you opened, uh, 
one of the problems with the internet and all of these things is that there's no difference between good and bad. I can say I love you or I'm taking out the garbage tweeting or mere texting and it doesn't mean anything. So it's the how you use it, as you said, that becomes vitally important because the words themselves are equal. Mm. Uh, on human rights defenders, if every human being knew and owned and could act upon their human rights, everyone would be a human rights defender and there is safety in numbers. The more people who are out on the streets, the safer the streets are. So it's very important for all of these communities and I've just spent the last three or four months between Egypt and Tunisia and I will tell you, the more people who are out on the streets, the more people who are organizing themselves, the more people who are learning, the safer those communities will be and the less manipulative some of those governments will be. Uh, I'm just trying to go quickly. Uh, in Egypt, for example, a big part of that revolution was labor. And when labor came out, and labor wasn't dependent on the internet and wasn't dependent on any of those things. It was word of mouth and the old fashioned union organizing. So there were many, many elements and there are still many elements and so technology has a role and plays an important role, but it really has to be put in perspective and kept in perspective because otherwise we get carried away with something that doesn't really exist. And the important thing is that the tool as a tool really needs to move the issues forward and the transparency, as you said, forward because otherwise it becomes just a tool. And the tool is effective when the mass understanding of what democracy is, what human rights are, what freedom is, and how it can be integrated into everyday society, that will really make a huge difference in how those tools can be used in a positive way. Yes, I'm Alan Jacobs. I'm president of B'nai B'rith International. Uh, question to the panel. Uh, the coming of the, uh, what is happening in the uh, explosion in the, not only the internet, but in all the media, social media. How do we protect the human rights of people? What is the role of the government, uh, for those of you who are in government, and what is the role of social media to protect the human rights since it is open, uh, it's an open door to those who want to violate human rights as well? I, I think the answer to that is what Yuna said in the beginning. The same laws, regulations, and rules that applies everywhere else should apply on the social media. That is, uh, we have, I mean, Sweden and Norway are the same, extremely protective of the freedom of speech and the freedom of information. But there are limits. I mean, incitement of hatred uh, would be illegal if you have it in a newspaper. Same thing applies on others' media. So the, the legislation is technology neutral, but that is an important point. But I mean, the same things could happen in a newspaper, could happen in somewhere else, could happen in the social media. The policy approach should be the same. It should be technology neutral. Dan, I agree. I, I, my, my sense is, however, that what we have seen in, 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 in recent years, that you can be anonymous on the net and say things that people wouldn't ever say not in writing, if they wrote a newspaper piece, and not directly in personal. Others pick up that message and, and, and develop on it, and you get these kind of virtual communities. <laughs> and you know, this is what we see, uh, again, coming back to, to what we have been through in Norway, where the, um, the, uh, the man who committed this uh, terrible crime obviously has been in that kind of virtual community on the net. Uh, which cr cross borders and across, uh, you know, uh, uh, lines, creating that sense of community. And, and uh, again, as Carl said, there is a very, very uh, tall um, uh, limit here to restrict um, uh, freedom of speech. But at least we should start by understanding what this means, what these phenomena are. I mean, from the way we deal with our kids. I mean, that's that's a theme now when we go to to, to meet uh, teachers in the class. How do we deal deal with uh, with uh, the tone on the uh, SMS on the Facebook on, on on the Twitter? You know, there's a, there's an atmosphere there which can be bad. So we go back as parents and tell our kids, you know, you must not be bad on the net. But it starts there, and it's a new phenomenon. And and as uh, I think the point is that everything which was um, 
a challenge be without this technology is a challenge with the technology. And that we have to understand. Man in the back. My, my name is Monzer Salim. I'm with the Mission of Egypt here in uh, New York. And I actually have a few questions to, uh, to the panelists. The first of which is referring to uh, the issue between that balance of freedom of speech, between the freedom itself and the responsibility associated with it. And in the time where the region is witnessing a lot of change motivated by social media, and we're flipping the switch didn't work, and I think it will, never, it will never work in that region because of the power of the people. But at the same time, we're witnessing that in a lot of um, democracies, well-established democracies, there are federal and national legislation for sort of preserving the security. But at the same time, it might be infringing on the privacy of the individual in the net. So how do you draw that sort of intricate balance between the security versus the freedom. My second question is, we've been talking about the power of the people, we've been talking about the responsibility, corporate social responsibilities, but where is the responsibility of the media? Governments are accountable to their people, but at the same time, I think the media should be accountable to their population as well. Is the media, or should the media, should there be a code of ethics? Should the media be uh, aware that the spread of the information does affect the dynamics of the society to a greater extent and the spread of uncertain information might be harmful, the spread of hate speech, the spread of other, other forms that could negatively affect the society. That's another question. Does the media have as a responsibility and what that responsibility is? Um, my final question is, when it comes to the forward looking, um, I think at this stage in time, with what's going all over the world, not just in the Middle East, there is a need that, as His Excellency the Minister of, Foreign, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden pointed out, we need to look into the future and get ourselves from the straight jackets and of the present or even of the past. We need to innovate our way of thinking to deal with these issues as they will present themselves now and even in a couple of years. I wouldn't put it five years in the future. Thank you. Hi, Henry Jacklin, Director of the Private Sector Division at UNDP. Reflecting on Minister Bilt's opening statement and also, Maria, what you've been saying, there's something that just strikes me as an opportunity with this entire discussion and this entire theme. And it goes back to the, la the end of the last century when a lot of people were struggling with the concept of global public goods, for the environment especially. But it never really took off because there wasn't enough clarity, specificity, and the overarching nature of it is not as convincing to all people as this is. Um, there is nothing like what has happened and the retaining the freedom of invention that created the internet and allowing the invention to continue means that the private sector has to be a continued engine, not just for the Twitters and the Facebooks, but for the innovations that are already happening and helping penetrate in markets that have never been touched. But this is really a challenge. If we can find first principles of what people have been trying to define as a global public good, this could be the precedent for a different kind of international participation, collaboration, alliance between public and private. But it could be like the internet itself, like the whole invention, a one of a kind that could also influence us in other areas, such as environment even. But I think it's, it's something that has to be treasured and put into a space that lives all on its own. I love that you start with the Gutenberg, but I really, there is nothing in, the, in civilization that we can look at that, that has this kind of permeation at this speed and that has the possibilities for changing societies. And, and this is just a moment in time, what we're talking about in North Africa. I mean, if we talk about villagers in Africa, then we start talking real revolutions. So I just think that it deserves a space that doesn't exist, and I, semantics never solves anything. But the, the original concepts around global public goods were very intriguing because they, they challenge a different kind of uh, uh, association, alliance, uh, and certainly not. When ICANN was being discussed in the UN framework, I died. I said, no way. You know, that, that was not the place to put it. But where do you put it? You know, I mean, it's, it, and, it, and it should retain the freedom that it has. So anyway, I just put those thoughts out for your, for your consideration. Perhaps there's a hash, global public goods. We can work on that. Just behind. 
Thank you. I'm Massimo Tomasoli, Permanent Observer for International IDEA to the UN. Uh, I think that the underlying theme that has been addressed is the, the, the new fact that there is connectivity, and these are tools that improve this connectivity. In fact, the, 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 the very action of democracy building uh, institutions should be rethought in line of these. Uh, the example of uh, cell phones in Africa uh, can be applied to electoral observation, and in fact, the case of Kenya uh, is a good example of how uh, such technologies has been, have been used in that respect. There is one element that I think uh, you may uh, perhaps deepen, deepen a little bit more. These new agency and social mobilization tools in a gender perspective, have they uh, addressed some fundamental uh, issues of inclusiveness uh, in, uh, in the Arab Spring? I'm sorry, in a general perspective or gender perspective? Gender perspective. Okay. Nora, would you? <laughs> the last question you need to answer. Do okay, you want them to repeat? Yes. Can you repeat? Uh, the the last, just the last question. The last, just the last question. I've asked uh, whether these uh, tools have been used in a way that have uh, increased uh, the possibility of access and the voice for uh, parts of the population that have been uh, traditionally excluded. And therefore, in a gender perspective, uh, whether agency for women's groups, women movements have been improved. Yes, for the last question, of course, the answer is yes. And we are seeing more women engage on the internet than uh, men, uh, as per uh, the recent uh, statistics. So, uh, and as I'm saying, that the decentralization and going outside of the of the capital is what moved forward the democratization and human rights movement uh, in Egypt. It's exactly because of this widespread access um, of the uh, social network and tools. Um, so I, 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 I totally like support uh, this. And um, actually, in responding to um, the gentleman from the Egypt mission um, about the media, uh, the, his question about the media accountability uh, point of view, we have recently seen the Egyptian authorities shutting down uh, the satellite channels of Al Jazeera uh, live. Um, and here, when we're talking about media accountability. We have to examine the Egyptian media scene. There is a press syndicate in Egypt, which of, and of course there is a code of ethics for the Egyptian journalists. Um, but what we have seen is Egyptian authorities trying always to manipulate or influence uh, any elections uh, that take place. The head and appointing uh, heads for the newspaper who are lobbying or loyalists for the Egyptian bad regime. And uh, amidst any, many other things. We have a, a journalist who disappeared several years ago and who's still Rida Hillel, nobody can find him. So we, we have a systematic attempt or systematic way of tra cracking down on, on the media. And then we speak about media accountability. I think the best way to speak about media accountability is just read the circulation statistics in the streets. The worst newspapers in Egypt are the least selling newspapers. And many of them are government papers, and they are losing a lot of money. And now, after the revolution, they are struggling to survive. So I think. Let the reporters work, let the journalists work, give more space and freedom, and don't start looking about borders and limitations. The scene will do its own filtrations. The Egyptians will do their own filtration, and they will only choose the best. Uh, you can trust this. And um, if we are talking security versus, uh, versus freedoms, again, whose security are we talking about? We should be talking about security of the individuals, security of the users, not security of the regimes and of the governments. As, uh, as a journalist and as a blogger, as an, an activist, I was very, very alarmed by the British uh, authorities' statements about the London rights and the, their blaming of Twitter. And it's like, what is this? <laughs> like, um, it was really, really shocking to me. And I hope that not only our governments, but all the other governments are always careful, especially those who are portrayed as um, you know, with countries with good record on human rights or with good prisons or good police facilities, you must be very careful about what image do you export to our part of the world. Thank you. We have time for two or three more questions. Yes, third row. You with the yellow sheet. Yeah. I don't know. Mine. 
um, Kai Stavel with uh, BDP. I have a question, and it might be unfair because we only have one person from a private company, but going back to what, what was raised on the front row initially, if you look back at how we can use social media, uh, in March 2011, Twitter removed the ability to access archives so that we could see tweeted archives to conduct analysis. And I mean, this was very important. We concerned to the Arab Spring. You would see where, where did the tweeting take place? Did it take place inside, outside the country? If you could just elaborate a bit on where does the transparency then end when the company that's providing this tool, because that's what it is in the end. I mean, it's a tool that people choose to, to elevate their ideas, to move their ideas forward. I mean, it's not necessarily people tweet and then something happens. And I think that goes back to what was pointing out, pointed out with Britain, where people were using it as a tool to organize flash mobs to rob a store. Uh, so I'm, I'm just curious why, why I, you might not be the one to answer it, uh, but why, why Twitter disallowed the ability to go back into tweeted archives for, so, for, for people to, to, to do research. Sure, I mean, I'm definitely not the person to answer that question. I don't know the answer. Um, what I can say, though, is that we've, sorry, oh, sorry. Um, we heard about five minutes ago that uh, the good quote that legislation is technology neutral. Um, I think by the, by the same account, technology should be uh, politically neutral, politically neutral in the sense that it shouldn't bow to the pressures of local governments. And I, you know, as an individual actor on the stage of this world, like you all, think there's a problem when a private company is, is bowing to the pressures of a government. Last question, gentlemen here. Uh, thank you. I'm Jordi Torren from the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. And, uh, one, I think that one of the questions and issues that was brought to the table is what can governments do to this flow of information and to this facility that uh, truth or reality or fake representations of reality and truth, it's so easily accessible by populations, by people. So one thing that I would propose is to, to policymakers is to actually to bring media and information literacy curricula to the school systems at the early, uh, early age, as soon as possible. So actually to empower uh, children, but uh, uh, citizens in general, to use critical thinking skills when it comes to media representations of themselves and then the others. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, short remarks by the panel in the end. Uh, Maria, would you like to begin? You know, so many different, thank you. So many different questions uh, have come up and uh, I found myself really writing two words to sort of uh, um, summarize uh, many, many of the, the questions, the nuances, the different uh, um, issues that we face as we look at social media. I think the, f the, the first phrase is freedom of expression. I mean, this is one of the fundamental uh, individual liberties that we seek to retain, that we believe in as the absolute core um, value of, of democracies. And so as we look at the way in which these tools are used, as we look at the way that they play a role in uh, enabling people to, uh, um, to utilize them, the freedom of expression has to be at the core. Now, issues that have to do with to what degree do you create any restrictions or to what degree do you um, look at ways in which you can uh, sort of protect society from predators or from others that are using uh, these tools. Um, we can do that. We can do it through uh, a rules-based approach uh, that l lays out some of the ways in which this can be um, done. But it has to be done um, absolutely maintaining that freedom of expression, that access to full expression as a, as a key issue. The other one is this question as you think of public good and you think of what government should be doing, uh, some of the issues that you've raised, is this issue of transparency um, that we haven't talked about so much in the use of social media. Um, but the question of how it is that um, governments themselves can make themselves more accountable to citizens, one of those ways is by being more transparent. and that 
can make use of technology um, in a way that we really are way underutilizing. Um, we are beginning to see on the part of some governments a real interest in figuring out how to do this. This is not something that I'm lecturing uh, as if no one was looking at. There are many governments. The, the Open uh, Government Partnership yesterday brought 46 governments to the table to commit themselves to try to figure out ways to use technology to make information about how they run their governments more available, whether it's um, relaying um, how budgets are put together, uh, whether it's relaying, which the Brazilian government is doing on a daily basis, how their funds are spent, uh, and anybody in Brazil can access that, whether it's uh, making data available from uh, which hospitals are resulting in more uh, deaths from heart surgery than others. I mean, you could just go across and find um, many, many different ways in which um, this can be a very important way in which we can um, um, we can move towards a public good, which is uh, really bringing governments towards uh, a much improved and strengthened way of carrying out um, democracies. Thank you, Mr. Tarif. Thank you. Um, one of the questions was about uh, security issues, and I think uh, Noor has answered very much to that. I think we're quite sensitive when it comes to the term security. Um, we have spent the last 50 years worried about the security of the state in the Middle East. So many people were sentenced uh, to years and years of jail or people who disappeared, etc., because of the security of the state. And I think somehow we feel rushed as if after the Egyptian revolution, democracy is there, or after the Tunisian one. I think if we look at the Middle East in 20 years from now and democracy is there, then we would say we have done some, some, some good job. Um, but when it comes to social media tools and the integration with what has been the traditional media, I, I think it's at this stage, it's very difficult, and this is a lesson from, I think, from perhaps Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Tunisia at this stage, that it's very little what actually the state can do if people have the will and if they have the tools. It's very little that what they can, uh, state can do. And about gender participation, I think the gentleman asked that. Uh, actually, it's not only women, even it's like uh, LGBT people, because with, uh, with social media tools, especially like Facebook or, or Twitter, um, a lot of LGBT people are able um, to provoke for their rights before they announce their sexual identity. Mm. Because in the Arab countries, most of LGBT people, if they don't announce their sexual identity and if they are saying things which is popular and reasonable, you know, people like it. But if they say he's or she's gay, then like, you know, they don't, people stop hearing what he or she is saying and they see the gay, the gay person. So I think in that sense also, yes, social media tools have, 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 uh, given a lot of minorities a big chance to, to contribute and to have their say. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to pass. Nora? Thank you. Um, just to answer Carol from Human Rights Watch, in Egypt we have a, a nice experience, maybe we should export uh, to some other places. We have the National Front to Defend Egypt protesters that was formed before uh, the revolution uh, started a few months, like when the demonstrations were taking over a lot in Egypt, and it's a group of human rights uh, defenders together with internet activists uh, and a large group of lawyers who would uh, anticipate the crackdown on uh, democracy activists and then support them in, in different ways. Now, this network has worked on two ways. One of them is educating NGOs, human rights uh, centers, NGOs, and the human rights defenders on using uh, internet tools and creating, you know, uh, the, the Twitter uh, accounts for them and making them use, really make right, the right use of their online presence rather than just PR of a conference or or something. And the other thing they have worked 
on very effectively is create a plan B. Uh, so when the internet is cut off, they use Bluetooth, for example, to spread videos and, uh, and information. So uh, this was uh, one very successful uh, experience we had due to the need. It's actually you invent things when you really need them. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more about the labor role in the uh, uprising. And it's still, I think Egypt is going to witness probably another revolution soon uh, because of the poverty. Uh, the poverty uh, problems and the economic problems have not been responded to. And if the previous uprising was because of, uh, uh, was led by the middle class and was targeting the more democracy and human rights, the next uprising is going to be targeting more food, fuel, <laughs> and jobs and housing, of course. So we have to be um, alarmed. And if the government and the SCAF cannot respond to the people needs, they have to really watch out from uh, what's going to happen next. Today, we have a strike. Uh, the teachers are striking. The bus drivers are striking. We have strikes all over Egypt. And it's not just Cairo. It's all over the country. And it's, it's really something is happening because and I think the media and the SCAF are to blame in this because they are portraying to the people and uh, the state television and the main, most of the mainstream media is portraying to the people that, bravo, you have finished your revolution, you are the greatest people on earth, now go home and everything is okay, we have a democracy, we're going to have elections. That's not true. Change did not really fully happen and we don't have a full revolution. We still have to work hard uh, on it. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I was a couple of comments on some of the questions, or one or two of the questions that have been asked. Uh, one was, um, how does it function? What's the role of politicians in the entire system? What's the role of governments in all of this? Well, first, to, as I said, the internet in the beginning, I mean, there, there was a beginning in sort of US defense research, but I mean, that was far after that. It's essentially a private sector driven thing. But you can argue that the internet is a public-private global partnership. And it is self-regulation. The internet, the structure of the internet is regulated and governed by those who are governing the internet. And it's essentially more private than public. There's been, we are now sort of, the UN is over there, and a lot of us have been active or active in the UN system. There was a move for a while to take the internet into the UN, ITU or something like that. I was among those that fought vigorously against that. Because that was a move driven by, say, the Chinese, the People's Republic of China. And you can, I don't need to go be too explicit on what we feared were their particular interest for bringing into the normal, multilateral, global machinery. We kept it outside. But there are some intermediary forum. There's something that is called, I think, it's called the Internet Governance Forum that brings together governments and private sector and other interests. As a matter of fact, it's meeting in Nairobi in the next week, if I remember it rightly, which has an element of more public and governance element to it. But I think we should keep, don't mess too much with something that has worked so well or they might not be that much in conformity with the principles that we are talking about elsewhere when we deliver speeches over here. What more can we do? Well, I think the discussion that we have now started on uh, uh, human rights and freedom on the net is, as said, very important. Uh, the report by Frank LaRue is worth reading. Uh, it is a highly detailed. It goes through the arguments and the regulations that are there in X numbers of countries. And, and of course, there are very, very difficult balancing issues. I mean, we discussed uh, hate speech. Uh, even more difficult is the issue of child pornography. What do you do about that? Um, and, and, and some countries or some cultures are more sensitive and somewhat oversensitive, in our opinion, to what they consider defamation. That's a discussion we have elsewhere in the UN system. And then some governments, for more political reasons, want to regulate somewhat more. It's a very difficult line to draw. But I think it's important that we have that discussion on the international level, so that we can then also take international political action <coughs> against those that are interfering too much. But as said, uh, there are borderline cases that are not, not entirely easy. And my aim is, anyhow, that we should be able to build from that discussion what you can call a global internet freedom alliance of those uh, countries, those governments, those parts of the world uh, that have these same values. 
and see the internet as the key, one of the key enablers for building a better future, but also the necessity of now focusing more both on the freedom of the net and building an alliance for that, but also, as I said, on the security and stability of the net, because there are those that have other designs, even evil designs, disrupting the net, uh, using it for evil purposes. And we must take that into account and not only be you should do gooders. We must also be somewhat realist in what we are doing, because this is going to be extremely important in the years to come. Thank you. I, I think there's one theme that we can address next time we meet, and that is really to try to understand the social consequences of a new technology and the social consequences of a communication revolution. I mean, we touched on Gutenberg, what that did to Europe, and this, what this is doing to the world. And it is doing something to the Middle East, to the Arab world, it's going to do something to Iran. It's going to do something to China. Uh, I think that you know the, the 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 force of this spread I is such. But coming down to our societies, we have societies that are not that different to understand what it does to our social organization, what it done does to the communication among our kids, the relations between people and and governments. It's it's a huge agenda. So perhaps next year we do the tree release symposium on fundamental freedoms. So there's more to discuss. Thank you for all of you who came and. Thank you for the time.